I'm going to ask that you would stand with me as you prepare your hearts for the Word of God found in the letter to the Philippian church. Paul's letter to the Philippian church, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, in the New International Version, say this, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated in God's house. I'd like to tag this particular text and this message for these brief moments of sharing that we have together with the title, Content in Christ. Content in Christ. In the 5th century, an African man named Arrhenius, he was determined to live a holy life. So what he did was he abandoned the conforms of Egyptian society to follow a, a lifestyle of obscurity and austerity in the desert. Yet whenever he visited the great city of Alexandria in Egypt, he spent time wandering through its bazaars and the stores. As why, he explained that his heart, rejo his heart rejoiced at the sight of all the things he saw that he really didn't need. Those of us in society who live in, a, in this society flooded with goods and gadgets, we need to ponder the example of the desert dweller. You do know a typical supermarket in the United States in 1976 stocked 9,000 articles. Well, today when you go to your grocery store, it carries over 30,000 items in that store. How many of those items are absolutely essential? How many are superfluous? There is an old economic adage that says if your output exceeds your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall. Stress, stress is one of the leading causes of seen and unseen health problems. Stress will push you to and a new generation to use Facebook and Twitter and Instagram as outlets as their virtual diary where I bleed all of my problems and my pains to the world wide web so the whole world can know just how jacked up my life really is. Uh, uh, unhealthy stress, unhealthy stress can make you discontent with your life and dissatisfied with everything around you. Forget all that stuff, pastor, that says whatever my lot thou has taught me to say, it is well with my soul. As I'm so unhinged sometimes, that whatever it is, is never well with my soul. Whatever the it is, I don't like it. Some, some of us can somehow find the negative needle in a haystack of God's bountifulness. A man became envious of his friends because they had bigger and more luxurious homes than he had. So he listed his house with a real estate firm planning to sell it and to purchase a more impressive luxurious house. Shortly afterward, as he was reading the classified section of the newspaper, he saw an ad for a house that seemed just right for him. He promptly called his realtor and he said a house described in today's paper is just what I'm looking for. I, I would like to go through that house as soon as possible. The agent asked him several questions about it and then the agent replied to him, sir, you know that that's your house you already described and the truth of the matter is that some of us ain't never satisfied if it's sunny for somebody it's too hot. If it's raining, it's too wet. If it's cold, it's not hot enough. If it's light, it should be dark. If it's dark, it should be light. As a society we're growing increasingly dissatisfied with our own lives. We try to measure our lives by some mythological standard of success created by marketing machines and magazines. Uh, some folks, because we have trouble with being content, we drive our money, we drink our money, and we wear our money, all because we're trying to project an image that satisfies our ego's need for the spotlight. According to the Federal Reserve Bank, Americans owe more than $2.1 trillion to various 
business agencies. So our consumer culture makes us always want more and more. I got the iPhone 5 and that's all right, but now I need the 6 with color. I'm not content. I got a laptop, but now I need a miniature laptop. And because I'm not content, we end up giving all of God's money to American Express, the Visa, Discover, MasterCard, Macy's, Nordstrom's, and Saks because we're not content with Christ. We're not content on the consumption side, so we buy more, so it looks like we have more, but we are content with producing and owning very little. The real talk is that I believe that, that one of the reasons that we always are antsy to have more is because most of us want to identify with a God who serves us rather than a God that we serve. Help me, Jesus. We, we're so discontent in our society that we started to misrepresent God's identity to suit our society salacious pursuits in many pulpits across this country Sunday morning going on right now all over the nation at conferences and convocations some are guilty of stealing God's identity and misrepresenting God there are those of us who've stolen God's identity and we replace God with a prosperity genie we're not content to justify my dissatisfaction they're saying that God's chief concern is with your wealth and your health uh, there are those who have stolen God's identity according to Brian Carter, and replaced him with the universalism God. Uh, folks are saying that everybody is saved, uh, that every road leads to heaven. There's no right and there's no wrong, that, that only you got to do what you like to do, and if you don't like to do it, then don't do it. If it feels good, do it. We ain't content. Some, some of you have replaced God with a fast food God. Uh, have it your way relationship, attempting to redefine sin as everything but sin. Uh, we make it a lifestyle, elevating our flaws at the expense of holiness we ain't content we made for ourselves a political God a God who is a politician from a certain political party as if God is running for office trying to sell us and get a vote from us we want to hear to try and get our vote to determine his will understand this yeah you are a part of the church and you may get to vote every now and then but don't you ever forget that this is God's house we we made for ourselves this political God because in the Baptist church, we get to vote on everything. We forget that this is God's. God's house. We made ourselves a legalistic God, a God who only gives you a list of do's and don'ts. If I keep the list, I'm good. If, if I don't keep the list, I'm bad in a real sense. We're so befuddled about this matter of faith. We're so mixed up about whether to feed our flesh instead of our spirit, so bent on having everything in an instant that we're trying to create a designer God who has all of the parts we like and delete all the parts that we don't like about God. Uh, we don't want to hear about no wrath and uh, about, about, about judgment and condemnation. We don't want to hear about none of that. We just want to hear about how do I get money? How, how, how do I become more prosperous? Oh, I would that you would prosper and be in good health. And, and the truth of the matter is that we're discontent about the wrong thing. We should learn to be content with what we have, but never be content with what you are. If you seek first the kingdom, then what you have lines up with who you are. So what you have never dictates who you are, but who you are dictates how you view what you have. Uh, if you're tenacious, if you were as tenacious about changing lives, uh, about encouraging more love, loving more, giving more, learning more, and serving more as we are about accumulating more stuff than we could experience the wonder-working power of God pouring out his spirit on all flesh and God could build a society where there's food for every belly and education for every mind, a home for every family, love for every child, and hope for every heart. But you've got to learn to be content in Jesus. Philip Parham tells the story of a rich industrialist who was disturbed to find a fisherman sitting lazily beside his boat. The rich man said, why aren't you out there fishing? He, he asked him, but, but he said, because I've caught enough fish for today. Uh, the fisherman told him, uh, uh, why don't you catch more fish than you need, the rich man asked. Well, what, what the fisherman said, well, what would I do with them? You, you could earn more money, came the impatient reply. You could buy a better boat so you could go deeper and catch bigger and more fish. You could purchase nylon nets, fancy nylon nets, catch even more fish and make even more money so soon you'd have a 
fleet of boats and you be rich just like I am. The fisherman asked him, then what would I do? Uh, the guy, rich guy said, you could sit down and learn to enjoy life. Uh, well, the fisherman looked at him and said, what do you think I'm doing right now? Uh, the fisherman replied as he looked placidly out at the sea. In a real sense, your contentment cannot be dictated by what others say about you to define who you are. You have to declare that your ontological status, your, your being, your isness, the stuff of your existence will not be determined by what other folk are saying to you. Your understanding of your own joy and your peace cannot be determined by what people are saying about you. You got to learn to testify this joy I have. You didn't give it to me. So guess what? Ain't nothing you going to say to me to take it away. Yeah, Paul, the transformed tormentor of the church, gives me a personal testimony when he says, I've learned whatever state I'm in to be content. Brother Paul, brother Paul is well acquainted with people and circumstances that can rob you of your peace. This letter is written directly from the Roman County Correctional Institution and it's here that Paul is living and, and he says this, he says, I've learned to be content. Paul, you are locked up, you're incarcerated in the regional jail and you talking about I've learned to be content. He has received a Philippian visitor named Epaphroditus who shows up from the deacon board of Philippian Baptist Church to check on Pastor Paul. The people want to know about Paul's condition so Paul pins this motivational missive to thank the folks for their thoughtfulness and to strengthen them with the word. He tells them I'm in jail but guess what? Even in this dilapidated dungeon I've learned how to be content. Paul, Paul you're helping a brother now. This was no innate quality. He says I've learned through life's experiences how to be content. You know you're not born content. We all born selfish. You, you do know when you're born, you're born selfish. selfish. Why? Every time you cry, somebody got to feed you. Every time you cry, they got to change your diaper. Every time you cry, they got to pick you up, put you down, pick you up, put you down. You're born selfish. But the problem is, is if you live the rest of your life like that. Uh, when Jesus says become as a little child, he's not telling you to revert back to being selfish. He's talking about being humble, being committed and consistent that that I need to depend on somebody else I need to depend on God Paul says I've learned through my relationship with God I've learned that what I'm in can't get me down unless what I'm in is allowed to get inside of me the highs and lows of life do not change me why Paul Paul says because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me he comes to the conclusion that his contentment is only there not because he's some super sanctified individual but because of Jesus the Christ himself. So Paul from the dungeon pushed me to wonder how, Paul, do we learn to live with contentment? I'm glad you asked from the balcony that three answers and we'll have communion first. First, you got to know that your sufficiency is in the Savior. You got to know that your sufficiency is in the Savior. Help me, Holy Ghost. The text in its original language means I have power. I am strong through Jesus. So, so if you want to learn to be strong enough to handle paucity and power, prosperity, to handle racism and reconciliation, to handle division and unity. You got to know that your sufficiency is not in your situation, but it is in and through Jesus Christ. Your sufficiency can be in the Savior, Paul knows, because Jesus always goes farther in his love for you than you do in your love for him. So my contentment is as strong as my relationship with Jesus. You do know that you can depend on Jesus. Again, Sam Proctor taught me that he always goes farther for you. The secret to contentment is Jesus the Christ. Oh, oh, with all the riches and bountiful blessings, uh, with all of our intelligence and cognitive capacity, we still got hungry people. Uh, we still have people in need because there seems to be a need to always exclude somebody, to have some list that some folks are on and some folks are not on. There always is a need for us as Americans, as humans, to treat somebody as an object of estrangement. We've all got to have somebody we can look down on so we can feel good about about ourselves to ascribe to some group some inherited negative genetic trait some indelible pessimism to make them look less worthy people are people and we always doing people stuff so your sufficiency can't be in people in predicaments or in your power but your sufficiency must rest and say in the Savior because Jesus always goes farther he goes farther 
to strengthen you and to straighten you for the journey forward. With Jesus, where I am never changes who I am. I am whose I am if I'm celebrating my success or if I'm confused about my situation. My Savior goes farther to let me know that I can depend on him. Jesus, you do know, he applauded the faith of a Roman centurion. He received into his fellowship all of the marginalized persons of his time. He lifted up a Samaritan with leprosy and he showed compassion on a Jericho road. Jesus always took the initiative to affirm the value and the worth of those who were different from the society. So that's who you ought to ride with all the way, all the days of your life. If you don't trust Jesus, the church will be debilitated. The community will be devastated. Our schools will be dominated. Our streets will be dilapidated and our world will be disintegrated. Paul was simply telling us that your happiness won't just be when your happenings are happening in your favor, but you can have joy as long as you got Jesus. You can have joy all the days of your life. In 1887, Anthony Showalter, he got two letters from his former students alerting him that both of their wives had died. Two of his students said both of their wives had died while considering what to write them back. He and Elisha Hoffman found comfort in Deuteronomy and wrote down words that are timeless. We still say them today. They wrote down these words. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord. So near leaning on the everlasting Then I think they got happy and they said, lean and lean and uh, safe and secure from all alarm. Uh, lean and lean and lean on the everlasting arms. Uh, and I was just wondering if there are 14 people in here that say, Pastor, that's my testimony. I know that my security is in the Savior because I can always lean on him. Uh, uh, don't put your trust in a man or a woman. Don't put it in a government or in a church because we are often fickle and fainting. People will get on your nerves in church. They'll make you leave the church. They'll run you out of church. Don't put your trust in nobody that's in a church or anybody that's in government don't put it in the governor don't put it in the president you better put your hope and your trust in Jesus the Christ and know that your sufficiency is in Jesus yeah help me help me God Help me, help me, help me, God. I've decided to trust Paul's plan and know that my sufficiency, my stability, my vitality, my visibility, my viability, my victory, all rest in Jesus. People are people and we do people stuff, but on Christ, there's always higher ground. Uh, my sufficiency is in Jesus because guess what? Whatever you give Jesus, he always gives you more. Huh? He makes something beautiful out of the mess you bring him. Huh? He'll turn your trash into treasure. Though my sins be as scarlet, he will washes them whiter than snow. Huh? He'll change you from the inside out, not from the outside in. Has Jesus changed anybody? Huh? Has he delivered anybody? Make sure your sufficiency is in Jesus. Uh, but secondly, secondly, not only do you need to know that your sufficiency is in the Savior, but if you're going to be content, you got to know the source of your strength. You got to know the source of your strength. It ain't you. Let's let just point to yourself and say, it ain't me. It ain't me. I, I'm not the source of my strength. Paul says, I've learned to be content. And, and the reason he learned it is because he realized that his strength did not come from the stuff he was able to accumulate. Content does not mean satisfied. It means autonomous. Doesn't mean satisfied. It means that you have freedom independent of your circumstances because of Jesus. When Paul says, I've learned to be content, he's saying, I'm not bound by what I'm in. But I'm free to be autonomous and celebrate no matter what it looks like around me, because Jesus is always with me. His strength did not simply come from an external source. Oh, Paul enjoyed the encouragement from the people. He enjoyed their support during his tough times. He was grateful for their prayers and dedication to this new religious identity. He was thankful that Deacon Lockhart checked on him while he was in prison. He was thankful. He was thankful that Deacon Rambo kept him on the prayer list. He was glad that the church didn't vote him out of his post. They didn't go, had called a meeting three weeks in a row, and 75% of the people said he's no longer our pastor because he's incarcerated. But he realized that while those things were helpful, they were not the source of his strength. 
He knew that the source of his strength was Jesus. That's why he writes to them that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, the African apostle from Tarsus is moving a brother. Now my core competency, my strength, my vitality are all there because Jesus is the source of my strength. It's not my affiliations or associations. You might, you might have some good people that's in your fraternity. You might have some wonderful folks in your sorority. You might have some wonderful people in your book club, in your golf club, in all the clubs you're affiliated with. With your colleagues and your customs might be wonderful. Your team at work may be wonderful, but guess what? They ain't the source of your strength. Uh, the, the source of your strength is Jesus. My contentment is because Jesus is the source of my strength. See, if Jesus is not the source of your strength, then you will be woobly, wobbly, woozy, and weak need in your faith. Uh, you can be easily manipulated and handled as it relates to your life's journey. Uh, you'll be tossed and driven, moved and shaken. You can be talked out of your beliefs if Jesus is not the source of your strength. You do know. I think that's one of the problems in church now. We got a lot of folks in church that don't know Jesus. Don't know. Don't know Jesus. You've been here a long time, but you ain't got no relationship with Jesus. You don't know him, so you don't bring him with you when you show up. Uh, imagine if we all knew Jesus and we came with a little Jesus joy down in our souls. Can you imagine how magnetic worship would become if everybody that came to church decided to follow Jesus? Uh, not a man, not a woman, but I I decided to follow Jesus. I want you to come to church, but the church ain't the source of your strength. I, I, I want you to be active in ministry, but the ministry is not the source of your strength. Those are tools that God uses to grow you and to guide you, but the source of your strength must be Jesus himself. Tim Keller, a pastor in Manhattan, New York, he said that in 1970, a Sunday school teacher changed his life with a simple illustration. The teacher said, let's assume the distance between the earth and the sun was reduced to the thickness of one sheet of paper. If that's the case, then the distance between the earth and the closest star to the earth would be a stack of these papers 70 feet high. And then she said the diameter of the galaxy would be a stack of these papers 310 miles high. Then Keller's teacher added the galaxy is just a speck of dust in the universe. But guess what? Jesus holds the universe together by the word of his power. She says, just a speck of dust, but Jesus holds the universe together by the word of it. You can say a lot of stuff, but you can't hold the universe together by the word of your power. Finally, the teacher asked her students, now, is this the kind of person that you ask to come into your life to be your assistant? Is this the kind of person you want to be your assistant? No, you ask that brother to be in charge. You, you, don't, you don't ask him to ride shotgun on the side with you and say, look, Jesus, I just want you to come with me along the journey. You better flip the script and you ought to get in the passenger seat and say, Jesus, you take the wheel and you drive me wherever it is that you want me to go. Because huh? I need Jesus. I don't need, I don't need Jesus as my assistant. I need Jesus to be in charge and to change my life so that that I can be who God called me to be. An unknown writer said that if your greatest need had been information, God would have sent you a scientist. Uh, if your greatest need had been technology, he would have sent you a technologist. If your greatest need had been money, he'd have sent you a banker. If your greatest need had been laughter, he'd have sent a comedian. Uh, if you needed new clothes, he'd have sent you a tailor. But I'm so glad uh, that our greatest need was forgiveness. Uh, so God sent us a savior. With Jesus, you got a love that can't be fathomed, a life that can never die, a righteousness that can't be tarnished, a peace you can't understand, a joy that can't be diminished, a glory that can't be clouded, a purity that can't be defined, a beauty that can't be marred, a wisdom that can't be baffled, and resources that never run dry. You got to know the source of your strength. <coughs> you know that your sufficiency is in the Savior. You know the source of your strength and the promise the promise of the text is this, that if you know that your sufficiency is in the Savior, you know the source of your strength, you'll be able to keep your sanity during the stormy seasons of life. You'll be able to keep your sanity during the stormy seasons of your life. Remember that Paul wrote this letter nearly two millennia ago from a Sicilian dungeon with rodents and reptiles as his only companions to communicate with. Paul had gone from the glowing hopes of going to Spain. He was on his way to Spain. And if you've been to Spain, I haven't been there, but if you've been there, you, you know you can walk the, the delightfully dusty streets. The, you witness the curvaceous slopes and you can watch the busy coastal life. And he went from that, the prospects of that, to a small, cold, dark prison cell. 
So if there was anybody who was entitled to exchange his reasonableness, his sanity, for an opportunity to be crazy and cuss some folk out, it was Paul. Paul, in this moment, I would have forgiven Paul if the text said that he decided to cuss out the jailer. I would forgive him. I said, Paul, you, you were entitled to a few words that didn't fit the model of Christ. You were entitled to that one possible reaction as it is for some of us is to distill all of our frustrations into a core of bitterness and resentment. Some of you here today, some of you here right now have turned your irritation and annoyance at life into bitterness and resentment. That's why you're as mean as you are. The person, the person who pursues the path, according to Dr. King, is likely to develop a callous attitude, a cold heart, and a bitter hatred toward God, even though you sit in the pew in church every Sunday morning, and you exhibit this toward those you live with, but more critically, toward yourself. This reaction poisons your own soul and scars your personality, always harming the person who holds these feelings more than anybody around you. Paul, like some of us, he could have been detached and become too unconcerned to love folks and too passionless to hate, too detached to be selfish and too lifeless to be unselfish, too indifferent to have joy and too cold to feel sorrow. He could have been neither dead nor alive. He would have just existed in a space between he was being born and dying. He just living. I'm just, I'm just living, just living. No purpose, no passion, no nothing that scares you, nothing that makes you have joy. Just, I'm just I'm just living. There's people in church like that. I'm just living. I'm just, I'm just chilling, living. I'm just living life. It is, it is what it is. It, I can't do nothing about it. It is what it is. Paul had no cellmate. Paul was in there by himself. You're talking about a brother that could have lost his mind, but because he let the light of God shine through his life because he did not allow what he was in to get inside of him. He was in prison, but he wasn't a prisoner because he understood that God's promise of protection is not provisional, but it is perpetual. Then those who were incarcerated with him and those who kept them locked up were starting to be led to Jesus. Guess what? The jailers started to know Jesus. He was able to keep his sanity, his sense, and his soundness because he knew that his source and sufficiency we're in the Savior. You do know that he did tell Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and guess what he gave you? A sound mind. If you find your sufficiency in Jesus, you'll be able to keep your sanity when the storms show up for your life. The biographer of George Frederick Handel wrote that Handel's health and his fortunes had reached the lowest ebb they ever could reach. His right side had become paralyzed. All his money was gone. His creditors seized him and threatened that he was going to go to prison for a brief time he was tempted to give up on life and give up the fight but then he rebounded again and that's when he composed the greatest of his inspirations the epic messiah the hallelujah chorus Handel's messiah was born not in a sequestered seaside villa in Spain but it was born in Paul's narrow undesirable cell to keep your sanity during life's stormy season you got to be able to turn disappointed expectations into opportunities to serve God's will you've got to know that you can do all things through Christ who strengthened you. You didn't get it like that. Years ago though, if you flew from New York to London, you had to fly on a propeller type aircraft that required about 10 hours for a flight that takes about 6 hours now. When you would return from London back to New York, the flight would go from 10 hours to 13 hours on the propeller type aircraft. The difference was that when you left New York there was a strong tailwind that was in your favor, but on the return flight you're battling that same wind that helped you get over going over there. In a real sense, at times in your life, the tailwinds of joy, triumph, and fulfillment will favor you and push you to bliss and joy and to celebrate your life. But then, then, then there will be other times when the headwinds of disappointment, sorrow, and tragedy will fight against you. And the way that you make it through it all, the way you keep your sanity is through Christ who strengthens you. With Jesus, you got the courage to be. Through Christ, you can go on in spite of. Through Christ, no burden is too great. No adversity can tear your joy. I can do all 
things uh, through Christ because he gives me strength. Uh, Paul's light started to distinguish the darkness around him and shined a light on an irresistible Jesus who could warm any heart. Uh, parenthetically, the truth is that discussing deeply divisive issues, uh, addressing issues with sincerity and wisdom with love and compassion issue, issues such as racism and sexism, domestic violence, sexual abuse, slavery, and bullying, they don't only liberate those who are bound or victimized, but it also liberates the perpetrator as well. Uh, you do know that the bully needs salvation just like the one who was a victim. Uh, you do know that those who harbor hatred and want to return to ways of life that nullify and vilify and dehumanize people who are black and brown or who abuse women or who bully others because of their height, their weight, or sexual orientation, that they're locked up by their own ignorance, intolerance, and impertinence, and they can only be liberated, they can only be set free if somebody is ready and willing to be a light surrounding their darkness. Uh, hate can't put out hate, uh, and darkness can't defeat darkness. Uh, only love and light can open up pathways to freedom and justice. I hear my Bible scholars hollering from the back in your spirit, let your light so shine uh, before men that they may see your good works uh, and glorify the Father in heaven. Uh, my imagination tells me that Paul writing this letter, writing this prison epistle, he might have been the first one to start humming out that children's tune. Uh, oh, this little light of mine, uh, I'm going to let it shine. Uh, can you imagine Paul in his prison cell uh, saying, all in my cell, uh, I'm going to let it shine. Uh, shine, shine, uh, I'm going to let it shine. Uh, or maybe he sung an old psalm uh, and from the book that said, the Lord is my shepherd, uh, I shall not want. Uh, he makes me lie down uh, in green pastures uh, and beside still waters. Uh, and while his cell was dark and dreary, uh, while his bed was thistle and stone, uh, I believe that Paul started to see in his imagination uh, some supernatural green pastures uh, and some still waters uh, and said, God, I'm content. Uh, I'm content because uh, my sufficiency ain't in me, uh, but it's in Jesus. Uh, I'm content because uh, I know the source of my strength. Uh, and so what should be uh, a stormy season? Uh, it doesn't shake my life, uh, but I still got joy because uh, I got Jesus. Uh, this should have been a dark time uh, in Paul's life, uh, but Paul shouts, I'm content. Uh, I'm not powerless. Uh, I'm not fruitless. Uh, I'm not hopeless because uh, I can uh, do all things uh, through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, I got power uh, even in my circumstance. Uh, if you want to stand in victory, uh, serve with gladness. Uh, keep your sanity. Uh, then somebody's testimony ought to be, uh, I woke up this morning uh, with my mind uh, stayed on Jesus. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that got up this morning uh, and said my mind uh, is stayed on Jesus. Uh, I got down to pray because uh, my mind uh, was stayed on Jesus. Uh, yes. Uh, say yeah. I got my I gotta go. I gotta sit down. I gotta sit down before I go. Let me let me just remind you, D.M. Stearns was preaching in Philadelphia. He was preaching in Philadelphia at the close of the service. A stranger came up to D.M. and said, I don't like the way you spoke about the cross. Uh, I think that instead of emphasizing the death of Jesus, it would be better to preach about Jesus, the teacher, and the example. Pastor Stearns replied, if I presented Jesus in that way, would you be willing to follow him? And the stranger said, I certainly would. All right, then, Pastor, Pastor Stearns said he said let's take the first step he did no sin can you claim that for yourself by example there's your example he did no sin can you can you do that the man looked confused and bewildered at pastor Stearns. he said no i acknowledge i do sin as a matter of fact i sinned right before i came to church tonight then then Stearns looked at him and said your greatest need isn't an example he said your greatest need is a savior and and i don't know about anybody in here but I learned a long time ago that I need a savior. Is, is there anybody here who needs a savior? I, I, I need a savior who was born in a manger, a savior who was wrapped in swaddling clothes, a savior who they called Emmanuel, meaning God with, I need a savior who is the word made flesh. Is there anybody here uh, that knows you need a savior? I need a savior who can heal the sick, uh, a savior who raised the dead, uh, a savior who turned water to wine, uh, a savior that makes demons tremble, uh, 
I need a Savior who was found guilty of grace. A Savior who gives mercy every morning. A Savior who gives hope to the hopeless. Is there anybody here that knows you need a Savior? A Savior who's a friend to the friendless. A Savior who gives joy and sorrow and hope for tomorrow. A Savior who's the Word made flesh. And I thank God that I found a Savior whose name is Jesus. Because I need a Savior who went all the way to Calvary. I need a Savior who took nails in his hands and nails in his feet. I need a Savior who was pierced in his side. A Savior who died on Friday. A Savior who was buried on us in a tomb. A Savior who was dead all day Saturday. But I'm so glad that I also need a Savior who early on Sunday morning, I said early on Sunday morning, he got up with all power. I need a Savior who's at the right hand of the Father. A Savior who's coming back for his church. A Savior who knocks at my door. A Savior with a reach that'll rescue you. A Savior with all power in his hands. Is there anybody here that needs a Savior whose name is Jesus? Stand with me. Stand with me all over God's house. If you're going to be content in Christ, know that your sufficiency is in the Savior. Know the source of your strength. And you'll be able to keep your sanity during the stormy seasons of your life. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? When I'm leaning on the everlasting arms of God, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Why? Because I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. Father God, we thank you today for Jesus. That we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And Father, there may be someone you sent here today who thought they needed something else, but realized, God, that they need a Savior. A Savior that was born in a manger. A Savior that died on a Friday. A Savior that got up from the grave on Sunday morning. That we might live abundantly and eternally. If they know they need a Savior, we pray, God, that when the invitation to discipleship is extended, they would be compelled to come. <laughs> 